and oh, okay. uh, queen queen bees uh the queen bee lived for years is fertile in fact her fertility is so potent she gives she gives birth to the entirety of the hive on the other hand uh worker bees only live for weeks and they're sterile what you might not know is that actually a worker and queen bees are genetically identical life forms that they're shaped uh into uh, two different organisms by the food they eat. So during development, the queen eats royal jelly as a larva and the worker uh, bees eat pollen. And the royal jelly, uh, components of the royal jelly essentially shape or reprogram the queen larva DNA so to turn it uh, into what is the anatomy and physiology of the queen. So to me, this story is a quintessential example of how components of food can really profoundly and intimately shape biological processes. And so when I think of food, I like to think of more than fuel of energy, but also as a type of information. And so the goal of my lab, and I've been in Michigan since 2015, is to really understand this intimate connection between food, gene, and brains. And we have two main questions. One is to try to understand the food information pathways. And the second question is to try to understand the rules of this communication. And that includes what are the messages, what are the mechanisms through, this me through which these messages are sent, perceived, and interpreted, what are the consequences for the physiology of the cells or the tissue? And then if any of these consequences actually have uh, or contribute to wellness and disease. So uh, today I'm going to tell you about what I think is like chapter one for my lab, the work done mostly by three, my first three uh, graduate students, the last of which is graduating just um, actually in a month exactly. And so uh, we uh, look at the effect of high dietary sugar on uh, the um, nutri-epigenetic reprogramming of the taste system and how this affects processes such as reward learning to then influence the size of meals and uh, body weight of flies. Uh, so uh, this idea actually came because we know that across organisms, both invertebrate and vertebrate in humans, the food environment has an impact on our eating patterns and on our body weight and our risk for disease. And uh, so two papers that came around the time I was applying for job and the time when I first um, um, I opened my lab really uh, made me more interested in looking at taste. So before that, I had really studied the nutrient sensing me mechanisms, so interoceptive mechanisms in the brain. And in fact, most of the animals I tested were taste blind. But um, especially after thinking about my dogs and reading about people experience, uh, it really seemed that perhaps if I wanted to look at this nutri uh, genomics uh, effects, taste could be a really good uh, a really good place because it's the first place in which we physically become in contact with food and there are all there is uh, uh, evidence that it is changed by the food environment by the diet and also uh, obviously taste is important for feeding behavior I feel like I don't really have to tell people in this audience but uh, other people I do um, it's not just important for the pleasure we get or for food or the detection, but also to make predictions about uh, what to eat, which are important for meal size. So when I started my lab, I wanted to understand how does high dietary sugar uh, in fact uh, change taste sensation and intake? Uh, does it actually change it? Uh, does it affect the taste cells or the sensory nerves? What are the effects in downstream circuits? What is the effect of food intake? And what are some of the causes and mechanisms? And so during the last six years of my lab, we've tried to touch on many of these po uh, points. So um, we study fruit flies. So one of the reasons we study fruit flies for this particular project was that, oh, there's some flies, that uh, <laughs> they're, um, they actually, they're very uh, amenable to this question because the taste system of mammals is what quite complicated, especially how uh, flavors uh, get processed in the brain and how they're integrated to make different feeding decisions. But uh, in flies, the taste cells are neurons that are located in the tip of the proboscis or the legs and in other places too, 
And then uh, in terms of the sugar sensing neurons are about 50 or 60 of them. And then they project directly uh, to the brain in a part of the brain called the subepithelial ganglion. And so we can uh, record from them, image them from a live behaving animals. We can obviously manipulate their, uh, their genes and their activity. Um, and we can also, uh, we also have a partially mapped connectum so we can kind of uh, follow the path of the taste signal uh, across the fly brains from input to output. So the other good advantage of flies is that um, there are pests that live in our kitchen. And so they are tuned to some of the same uh, things we like to eat, especially sugars. And so there is a model, there are several models of uh, diet-induced obesity in flies. And one of them is adding extra sucrose to their diet. And so this diet is about 20 and 30% sucrose, which is the sweetness of a cookie compared to the regular diet, which is about five to 10%, which is close to the sweetness of strawberries. And so when you put fruit flies on this diet here um, and we measure their feeding behavior, on a controlled diet, they kind of lick the same over a week, but on a high sugar diet, they show this escalation in feeding behavior. And then if we look now at day seven, and we measured their levels of fat mass as triglycerides over lean mass, which is protein, now uh, we can see that there's an accumulation of fat mass. Now, if we let them go for longer, for several days longer, they also develop a hallmark of uh, uh, metabolic syndrome, like insulin resistance and uh, inflammation and other things. Uh, so um, we uh, wanted to study the taste neurons of the flies, especially the one that express the sweet gustatory receptors, which uh, can be seen here in our real life. And one of the first thing we did was to measure the uh, responses to sweetness. So we use this assay called the proboscis extension response, where we trap a fly in a pipette tip and we touch its proboscis with a um, little kim wipe or pipette that has some sugar. And then we essentially um, measure the extent of the uh, proboscis extension from zero to one, where one is a full extension and it means they can perceive uh, the sugar. And so this is, I like to think of this as a measure of taste intensity. And uh, so when we did that and we put um, males that were age match, so all the same age on a controlled diet for 70 or um, sorry, on a sugar diet for 70 or a controlled diet and gave them different sugar stimuli from low to high concentration of sugar. You see that compared to the uh, taste reactivity curve on a controlled diet, they get a decrease of about 30 to 50 percent on a sugar diet in intermediate phenotype after three days. So um, we found that this phenotype was specific to sweet stimuli and didn't depend on the motivation of the fly. So if we fasted the sugar diet flies for much longer, they still showed a decrease in this uh, PR. So um, we also did a bunch of different dietary and genetic manipulation and combination where we gave, uh, uh, we tested the effect of having extra fat. So we use flies that are genetically uh, essentially obese. They have a, a mutation in one of the uh, lipases, so they cannot break down fat. So these flies have as much fat mass as on a controlled diet as the control flies have on a high sugar diet. This had no effect on taste. We also gave them a lard diet. Uh, and so high calorie, but no sweetness also had no effect on sweet taste. And then we gave them a high sweetness diet, but with the same amount of calories or a controlled diet. Uh, this is the same concentration of Diet Coke for sucralose, and they also had no effect. So none of these things by themselves affected sweet taste sensation, but only when we gave flies a diet between 15 and 30% sucrose fructo or glucose, even in flies that were genetically resistant to uh, fat accumulation or obesity, this were very likely to mutant flies, we got a decrease in their ability to sense sweetness. So uh, we next uh, look at the number of sweet sensing neurons. We didn't see any effects. So we turned to look at the effects on the, the cells and the sensory neurons. So we use a uh, sensilla recording to essentially measure the responses of the cells to uh, sucrose. And compared to a control diet here, we found a marked decrease. So the sweet sensing neurons are not responding as robust, robustly to sweet stimuli on the sensation end. 
But the other thing we can do is we can do neurosurgery on the fly, open a little tiny window on top of their head, and then uh, essentially head fix them, immobilize them, put them under a two photo microscope, express a protein that becomes more fluorescent uh, as the neurons get activated, whether it's measuring the levels of calcium or the levels of pH to measure synaptic release. So then we can touch the proboscis with sugar and then measure the responses now of the axon of the sensory neurons uh, in the brain. And so on a controlled diet, you see the neurons responsive to sugar, they get a higher fluorescence and in a high sugar diet, there was essentially barely a change. And so not only the sensation of uh, sweetness is decreased on the sensory end, but also the transmission of the sense, the taste signal is uh, prevented out of the sensory neurons. So this is a sensory phenotype. We also uh, use some molecular genetics to look essentially at the cell specific transcriptome of the sensory neurons. So we use that, we use the ribosome that was tagged so we could just look at the RNA associated with the ribosome and just the uh, 60 cells in the fly proboscis. And what we found, we did this experiment both at three days and seven days on a high sugar diet. And so in here, things in gold or yellow are genes that are uh, silenced by a high sugar diet and in purple genes are, are um, show positive changes. And so there is a pretty uh, big remodeling of their transcriptome at uh, three days, about 60% of genes are down, but at uh, seven days, about 90% of their genes are silenced. And the genes are in common between two and uh, three and seven days, actually most of them are down. So there is like this kind of massive drive in transcription repression, which is actually interesting because when other people have done these experiments for other tissues, for uh, rodents that have been on similar diets, they've also seen this uh, profound skews. Uh, they're kind of one of the hallmark of some of this nutri uh, genomics effects sometimes. Uh, so one of the things we also were <laughs> doing before COVID that we just started to do at the end is, um, I forgot to mention, so most of these genes actually, uh, when we look at their pathway uh, and enrichment analysis, they fall into synapsis uh, function, signaling like signal transaction and metabolism, and we didn't measure any changes in the expression levels of the taste receptors or some of the transduction signals right downstream of them. So we became interested in looking at synaptic morphology and connectivity. So one thing we can do uh, that's pretty great about this model is that we can express proteins that uh, label the active synapse here in red and also fluorescent protein that uh, label the branching of the axon. So this is a presynaptic size of those cells. And then we can reconstitute the external volume and count the number of synapses. And so we're just restarting uh, this work after COVID. And so these are some of the example here where we have a part of the SEZ, which is not the taste area of the fly brain where the axon of the sensory neurons are. And we think we're seeing some kind of changes in connectivity and branching that are occurring with the sugar diet, but not on a controlled diet. And so we're now like studying this and trying to characterize them and um, look at what's causing them. So sort of uh, link genetic information to flesh and broad blood, or in this case, synaptic proteins. So to summarize for our working flies, we've shown that on um, uh, high dietary sugar uh, induces a uh, decrease in sweet taste intensity. I didn't show you, there's also a uh, decrease in sensitivity uh, that we published in 2019. This was due to lower responses of the taste receptor cells to sweet stimuli, to lower transmission of the sweetness signal, and to some transcriptional changes suggesting synaptic and transduction alterations. We didn't see uh, any effects of obesity by itself or high dietary sweetness by itself uh, uh, in, in terms of like non-caloric sweeteners and no changes in the number of taste receptor cells, which again are neurons in this organism. And also I didn't talk, I'm not gonna really tell you today, but this is published in our Science Advances 2020 paper. We found that these deficits in sensation were persistent and that about 50% of the transcriptional changes that I described actually persisted even after the animals had been uh, moved on a controlled diet for over a week. So uh, one of the other things we wanted to do 
uh, is to look at whether these changes in sensation are also occurring in rats. Uh, we are close to submitting this work, which was a really amazing collaboration with um, uh, Robert Bradley and Charlotte Mistretta, I can't believe that, uh, from the dental school um, at Michigan, and Carrie Ferrario, who's my really good uh, colleague and friend from uh, the Department of Pharmacology. So uh, we essentially gave rats, uh, took rat, male rats that had their standard chow, but then we gave them for four weeks either water of 30% sucrose uh, to drink. And then uh, Robert did the corda timpani nerve recording, and also uh, Charlotte taught us how to analyze the fungiform uh, papilla and do a taste fat analysis. So um, we'll present this poster at ACAMS if you're there, but I'll give you a preview of some of this work. So uh, what we found is that after four weeks, we found essentially a reduction from four, compared from the water rats and the sucrose rats. And it was a quite marked reduction of the sensory nerve ability to respond to both low and high concentration of sucrose. Uh, as you can see here from uh, the recordings. And we didn't see any changes in the sodium chloride responses in our experiments. And that's what the sucrose was normalized to. Uh, we also analyzed the number of the fungible papilla in the front of the tongue, and also the distribution of the three types, type one, type two, and type three, which describe the kind of a wholeness or the morphology of the taste bud. And we didn't see any changes in the number or distribution of the fungiform papilla in the sucrose rats either. And uh, we then look to uh, the taste buds. So we measure a few things. So one of the things we measure was the innervation. We label the sensory nerve with P2X3 uh, in green here. And also we labeled uh, the taste bud cells with an antibody about, uh, against keratin 18. And so we measured the diameter of the taste bud and also their innervation here uh, by drawing this box. And so here uh, you can see the water and sucrose samples in this columns. And we found uh, no difference in the taste bud diameter and no difference in the volume of the K18 taste buds uh, proper. And also we found no changes uh, in no significant changes in the innervation to the taste bud. Um, so uh, the next thing we started to look at was to look at within the taste bud and we selected the type two chemosensory cells. Uh, which uh, respond to bitter, umami, and sweet. And so we label with a PLC2 uh, antibody, and then we counted their number in the um, fungiform uh, papilla taste buds, and what we found was a significant reduction. And so now what we're trying to figure out is try to see which antibody against subtypes of type 2 cells uh, to see if there's change only in the sweet sensing or uh, across. So. Um, Again, we're presenting this poster at ACAM. There's a lot more we tested. So uh, you're welcome to go to high-end poster there to find out more, but essentially in the rats, it's supposed to 20 days of uh, sucrose at the same levels of uh, concentration of slides. We found a mark response, about 50% response in the corda timpani uh, responses to sucrose uh, and in the number of PLC2 uh, cells but we didn't observe any significant difference to different sugars, to other uh, taste qualities, uh, to touch or cold. And as I mentioned, no changes in the morphology or innervation. Um, and uh, since then, actually, while we were doing the study, which was really shut down for two years of COVID, um, Lynette McCloskey showed that in female rats, uh, given the same concentration of, of uh, sucrose, there was also a response in the port of timpani nerve. And um, there was also another paper uh, that showed uh, after three days exposure to sucrose, there was a small difference in port of timpani uh, responses at one uh, concentration. So um, at least from uh, rats and flies, uh, an increase in uh, sucrose induces a uh, decrease in the peripheral sensory responses. Um, and we were interested in also now looking at uh, that, you know, since then other people have uh, 
uh, described, and it would be especially really interesting to see in um, if with humans higher sucrose will lead to a decrease in uh, sweetness intensity, like how many people have described when they go on a ketogenic diet or they cut sugar, uh, for instance, for fasting reasons and so on. So I'm really, really intrigued uh, by, by those studies that are coming out. Um, and so we thought we could use now the fly to try to understand our uh, causes and uh, mechanisms. So um, I told you that obesity alone, extra calories alone, or high sweetness with no extra calories had no effect. So that made us think about sugar metabolism. So we uh, began actually at the very beginning of my lab, trying to understand how variation in metabolic information occur uh, with a high sugar diet. And so we did a metabolomic study of fly head and bodies uh, with acute and chronic, both short and long-term exposure with a high sugar diet. And then um, this is published a few years ago, but essentially we came up with a top 20 metabolites that were uh, changes by, changed by high sucrose. And uh, one of this that really caught our attention was the exosamine biosynthesis pathways and many metabolites uh, here uh, that are increased by a high sugar diet with this bigger uh, hexagon. Um, and so this exosomy biosynthesis pathway is a metabolic pathway that's used uh, not for fuel, but for inflammation. And it makes this amino sugar um, uh, compound here that is then turned into this compound for UDP uh, glucnac, which is used by a protein, uh, an enzyme called oglucnac transferase of OGT, to post-translational modify protein with the serine and theanine residues. So this is very similar to phosphorylation when there is also a metabolic compound phosphate that is used by a kinase to change the activity of protein post-translationally and affect their activity. This is essentially very sim similar, only that it's a sugar, uh, amino sugar component that does that. And there's only one enzyme, OGA, that removes this modification. So we asked what would happen if we now knock down this OGT enzyme right here, only in the sensory neurons, since we saw an increase in the activity of this pathway, which has been described in mammals also that are exposed to high sugar or uh, high uh, energy diets. And so while we found that on a high sugar diet where we see this decrease in um, uh, sweet taste uh, sensation, when we knock down the OGT protein only in the sensory neurons at about 50% knockdown efficiency, we saw essentially a rescue of this uh, chemosensory plasticity. Um, and then when we did the opposite experiments, when we overexpress OGT only in the sensory neurons in flies that had their controlled diet, now we saw that compared to controls which have their normal sweet taste, the OGT overexpression flies actually resulted in a decrease in taste, um, this taste plasticity that was similar to what the animals on a high sugar diet um, uh, experience. And so for, for me, who was who, somebody who's interested in nutrients, I, mean, I was really amazed by this because it really suggests that this metabolic pathway can tune the sensory responses of the cells to the environment, which we usually think of more happening in interoceptive pathways, but uh, it means that the sensory cells, the distate cells can use both traditional receptor mechanism and interoceptive mechanism to, to tune their activity. Um, and what we found is that actually it wasn't just the level of the proteins of the mRNA and therefore of the protein we can manipulate, but also its activity. So if instead of removing the levels of OGT like we did, we just use a mutant that has catalytic, that's catalytically dead, so it cannot do the reaction that I explained. Now uh, we didn't get a rescue in uh, this taste plasticity with a high sugar diet. And conversely, if we overexpress a GT here in green compared to the controls where we induce the taste deficit, if we then use a drug that blocks OGT activity, we can completely block this effect. So it's really the activity of OGT that seems to be important. So, uh, so this, uh, this is also published, but um, some of this is also published. So essentially we found that uh, 
the increase in a high sugar diet increases the levels of this metabolic um, information inside the sensory cells, which activates this pathway, this OGT um, transferase. And uh, we know that it affects different protein targets, some of which are transcription and chromatin factors, some are transporters and ion channels, and some of the metabolic enzymes, synaptic proteins. So uh, we wouldn't be a fly labs if we didn't do a screen to try to understand what's downstream of OGT to try to understand some of this uh, nutrient sensing mechanisms. And so we did the screen and specifically look for factors uh, that had been previously linked to OGT and that were both necessary and sufficient for this taste plasticity in response to the dietary environment. So what we found is that this chromatin silencer, which is concerned from plants to humans, uh, polycom repressive complex two, uh, it's a chromatin complex that modulates SMP lysine 27 methylation, which is one of the most important repressive marks in our genome and the genome of many other organisms, was required uh, in the sweet sensory neurons. So when we knock down, I'm just showing you one of these components here, uh, on a sugar diet, we rescue here and think the taste plasticity or the deficits in taste that occur uh, with the gray control flies. And then when we overexpress these components on a control diet here, we can then induce the taste plasticity. So it's both necessary and sufficient for this diet dependent chemosensory alterations. And we found that this also required the catalytic activity of this complex. And it didn't just taste, change taste at the behavioral level, it also changed the neural responses. This was published in 2020, so um, I'm not gonna go too much into it. And importantly, when we look back at those transcriptional changes I told you about, where we see this repression of the uh, transcriptome of the sensory neurons. Now, when we do the same experiment in flies that have uh, essentially have a mutated uh, mutations in the repressive complex, what you can see is that we can revert uh, all the repression that essentially occurs. Uh, and we can revert most of the genes to the normal level. So we can essentially nullify the effects of diet on the cells. So the one thing we wanted to know is that whether this metabolic enzyme and uh, this chromatin silencing complex, uh, all the effects work in concert or if they are, uh, if they affect the activity of these neurons in uh, different pathways. So what we did, we did some epistasis experiments. So these are our control flies with a normal case and a controlled diet. This is uh, what happens to them on to their sweet sensation on a sugar diet. And when we overexpress OGT, we get flies that don't taste sugar. Uh, sucrose very well on both of our control and sugar diet. When we mutate the chromatin repressor, which is necessary for taste plasticity, we rescue this effect. And when we put both of them together, uh, we essentially prevent the uh, activation of this enzyme from having an effect on taste plasticity. So suggesting that this complex is actually downstream of this metabolic enzyme. And we have additional data to support that. So we wanted to know if the activity of this metabolic enzyme goes through uh, that of this chromatin silencer, well, how, how is it actually affecting the ability of this neurons to fire in response to sucrose? So we use a technique called uh, TADA, where essentially we can look at the binding of this particular protein uh, just in our sweet sensing neurons. Uh, we make some transgenic flies, then we induce this protein uh, only between three and four days because we wanted to look at the system as it was in fast progress as the flies have been exposed to a high sugar diet for a few days. By doing this experiment, we can also measure the chromatin accessibility uh, of uh, the cells in response to diets, so their nutrient sensing effects on the genome. So what we found is that when we looked at this chromatin PRC2 complex on the genome, we found that on a sugar diet here in purple, some binding increase in a sugar diet and some binding decrease. And this occurred a very specific transcription factor loci. And so you can see uh, here that on average though, the occupancy of this chromatin complex in the genome increased with a sugar diet in purple compared to gray, and the chromatin accessibility also decreased, which is what we would express, expect because this is our gene repressive complex that's closest chromatin. When we inhibited 
that metabolic enzyme ODT, we abolished essentially all the effects. So now we no longer saw redistribution of this chromatin complex. We no longer saw increased occupancy or any decrease in the accessibility of uh, the enhancers and promoters of those genes uh, to, uh, to the nutrient environment. Well, we also found that it wasn't just the chromatin complex that was bound uh, to chromatin, but actually the metabolic enzyme, enzyme was also moonlighting in the nucleus. And so we used the same technique to look at the binding of this uh, metabolic enzyme to see if it occurred on chromatin. And in fact, we found that it, it was, we found it on the chromatin of the sensory neurons. And then about a third of it was present in the promoter and transcriptional start site. And it associated uh, differentially on a control and a sugar diet with genes that were important for synaptic trifle regulation, signal transduction, neuroprojection, membrane, dendrite morphogenesis, calcium signaling. So those were uh, things we had seen on a sugar diet also. Oops. And then uh, what we found is that we asked what was the overlap between this binding to the genome of the chromatin and complex in the metabolic enzyme. And what we found is that uh, they were together at 162 loci. And uh, in this loci, the change in the repression of the chromatin accessibility was actually much higher than anything we've seen before. And that was completely abolished when we blocked the activity of OGT of this metabolic enzyme. So essentially this metabolic enzyme and um, this chromatin complex act together they're informed by the sort of information that's in the cell, the, the entire environment, dietary environment, and they mark uh, 150 really highly nutrient dependent low side that are mostly shut down by a high sugar diet. And this is occurring cell autonomously in flies. There are a number of things we're still trying to figure out, such as is this metabolic enzyme affecting the histone? Is it affecting the ability of this chromatin? Uh, um, complex to actually silence or a close down chromatin, and what are the silencing or relevant epigenetic marks. And one of the things we found is that this, this uh, OGT and PRC2, these two things together actually change the output of this transcriptional hub, which is important to determine the properties of the sensory neurons. So there are a network of genes that are controlled by this transcriptional hub, which uh, when they are changed by the high sugar diet via this, via this mechanism, they are essentially almost making the sensory neurons losing some of their identity as sensory neurons so that they're not functioning as well. So one of the things I'm really interested in is to try to apply this nutri-epigenetics, uh, nutri-genomic approach to uh, mammalian studies. And so we just begun with this. One of the very simple experiments we did was that to go back to the rats and then expose them to sucrose water uh, with chow and then got, take their uh, lingual epithelium and then do RNA sequencing to see, uh, to look uh, changes. Uh, where we found some uh, changes in cell differentiation, cell death, uh, some of the things probably are not too surprising. But uh, before we go on and we do some more complex studies, we uh, wanted to do if any of these genes uh, have been found to be marked or bound by metabol this metabolic enzyme in other tissue. There's actually only one data set. This is one of the things we could do during COVID, <laughs> uh, use other data sets that people have created. And we found that uh, compared to the genes, in the genes that are changed by uh, the sucrose in rats, uh, overlap with all the genes that are bound by this metabolic enzyme, there are a subset of this gene that uh, is bound by this metabolic enzyme. This data was from embryonic stem cells from mice. And then more of the genes that are changed by sugar in uh, green are actually bound by the metabolic enzyme compared to the genes that are not changed by sugar. And that these genes are also bound by the homolog of the chromatin remodeling complex in the same tissue. And so we narrow down this list from over a thousand genes uh, to uh, much less. I think it was like uh, less than 200 and that when we look at those genes, actually, uh, 
and compared to a database uh, paper that Linda Barlow recently published in ELAC where she had done some cell-specific measurements of gene expression, we found that nearly all the genes that were marked, uh, computationally marked by OGP in terms of prediction actually were important, uh, were expressed in the taste buds or uh, the taste buds, the taste cells or the nerve, and um, they were important for things like renewal and specification. And it was really amazing to see that at least one of those transcription factors is actually the homolog of what we found is changed by sugar and flies. So a lot more on this, but I'm really excited to kind of continue this work. And I um, sort of like chapter two of my lab after tenure, uh, I would like to be a lot more this nutrigenomic work. So I would love to in the future collaborate uh, with people to, to do some of this uh, in rodents and you know maybe humans one day. So. So just um, in the last few minutes uh, here, I'll tell you how this changes in chemo sensation, uh, whether they do play a role in food intake and uh, satiety. But um, so, so far I've told you how the food environment is sort of transforming uh, the chemo sensation system in flies. And we have some elements that that's also uh, perhaps occurring in rodents. Okay. so. Um, when I told you earlier that exposure to sucrose uh, blunts the sensory system of flight, uh, and we found that actually this blunting was, uh, was a direct uh, driver of higher intake. And so flyer, flies eat two meals a day, a breakfast and a dinner. Uh, they don't eat all the times they're active. And what we found is the high sugar diet, their meals became longer, not so much when the onset, but when the offset of meals. So the meals became much longer, almost doubled, almost as if they had a hard time terminating their meals. And so when we use um, optogenetics to mind control the fly and activate the sensory, the, uh, the sweet sensory neurons, only when the fly was licking the food. So this is a closed loop system. So kind of like they're feeling like they are sensing sugar, we actually could completely block here in pink the escalation in feeding behavior. And we have uh, tested this through many different mechanisms we published uh, a, few, a number of years ago, and we could also block their increase in fat mass. So essentially we can protect them from diet-induced obesity. Um, so this made us think if you know, thinking about this ancestral system through which sweetness is important for uh, to make uh, predictions about food that regulate eating, we thought, well, if this process is affected, which is the very extreme, the process that's coming downstream is also affected. So while the pathway that goes from the mouth to the dopaminergic neurons are different, these two endpoints are actually similar. And then the associative learning through which dopamine plays a teaching role to make this food association of memory, that's also a really, really ancient mechanism that which the neurochemistry of which is conserved in flies. So uh, we uh, look for dopaminergic neurons that were responding to sweet signals. This wasn't really hard thanks to the amazing work of many fly labs who've been studied this for a few decades. And so what we found is that this particular subset of them of energetic neurons, if you uh, now look at their activity in response to sugar tapes, so they're not eating sugar here, we're just making them taste it. Uh, there is an increase in the responses to sucrose here, we're looking at their axons. But if we give them a high sugar diet for seven days, we see a marked decrease, which is quantified here. But if we now uh, correct the effects of the sensory system by giving them this OGT inhibitor, which essentially corrects and normalizes, prevents the sensory neuron from decreasing this, from experiencing this decrease, now the dopaminergic neurons don't experience any changes, at least at the activity level. So, uh, so what we found that on a high sugar diet compared to a controlled diet, there was this decrease in the activity of the dopaminergic of this dopaminergic neuron to sucrose, and there was also a delay of about 800 milliseconds, which should have a really uh, big impact on the ability of this neurons to provide the teaching signals and the timing to make these food associations. So to understand if this had an impact on food intake, we inhibited uh, this dopaminergic neurons on a controlled diet here using an inhibitory rhodopsin. Again, this is a closed loop system. And what we found is that compared to control flies, which did the same, when we inhibited this neurons, the flies ate more. 
Conversely, if we give them a sugar diet and now activate in them, um, and we, we let the flies eat, eat for two days, and then we activated them on day three, compared to the control flies we keep overeating, the flies will recorrect the activity of this dopaminergic nonce in real time, now are protected from overeating and also uh, diet induced obesity. So if this, if this effects are affecting the dopamine signaling that we would also affect that the ability of, we would also think that the ability of the flies to make association about food is impaired. And maybe that is how the meals become bigger. So uh, we're now just looking at this, but thanks to the work of many labs here in flies and the Genelia Farm Connectome project, we actually know exactly which neurons are downstream of the dopaminergic neuron shown here in pink as the steel neurons. And these are, are required to make food associations. So now we can look at whether these neurons are receiving less dopaminergic signal during um, eating and during memories. And so here I'm just showing an example of this where we're giving the fly sucrose and we can measure from these steel neurons, not from the dendrites, how much dopamine signal they're uh, receiving. And in fact, they're receiving a lot less. And you can see how there's also a marked delay. And so now we can use standard uh, circuit and imaging technique to essentially visualize the flies make, making this food memory in real time. But what is important is that what we found is that these flies cannot make food associations anymore. So the flies on a high sugar diet. If we train them by associating an odor with water and the other odor with sucrose, and then we test their preference from one odor over other, usually flies are on their control diet. They learn to prefer the odor that's being associated with sucrose. So this would be the uh, condition stimulus plus. But on a high sugar diet here in teal, now we have uh, a deficit. So flies can no longer associate a food uh, order with sweetness. And if we do the same experiments in flies that are resistant to obesity, so these flies are genetically lean, even on a high sugar diet, we'll still experience this. Meaning that again, it's not the obesity, it's the exposure to diet. And so what we can do now, as we're still doing all the imaging study to understand the neural mechanisms, we still can test using optogenetics to see if this associative learning circuits are important for to regulate food intake and meal size. And so what we can do, we can, on a controlled diet, we can inhibit them. And then we can see this overeating here compared to controls. And we also can measure their uh, fat mass over lean mass. And here are the experimental flies in green. You can see they have much higher uh, fat mass. And then we can do the reverse experiments where we can now activate in this uh, neurons during eating. And now we can rescue the uh, overeating. And right here, the diet in the CDC when the flies don't show any changes in fat mass uh, in response to the high sugar diet. So there's still a lot we're trying to figure out about the neural mechanisms that link uh, those changes in chemosensory plasticity through dopamine and this food associations. But what is clear so far is that this reduced seamless uh, is affecting the reinforcing and rewarding effects of dopamine and it's affecting the ability to make food associations, which we know in humans are important to make predictions about meal size. So, um, so this is so far like the work we have done uh, and it really suggests that at least in flies and part in our work with rodents, the uh, high sh dietary sugar is really profoundly changing the sensory system to drive higher eating by affecting the downstream neural mechanisms that we know at least in humans are important to modulate meal size. And there is you know, still a lot to understand about all the pathways uh, that food, in which food talks to our brain and our body and so many things to still understand about messages, mechanisms, and consequences. And so I think this is a really exciting field and uh, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to you know, learning as much as possible and contributing uh, with our research. So this work was done by Anami Vaziri here, a graduate student, Hugo Pardo, some of it by Haiyan Sung and uh, Daniel Walensky, a previous student, Christina May, who's now a postdoc. And I'd like to thank you for your attention.
uh, all of our sources of funding, people that share reagents and times before publication with us, and um, our collaborators on this project and the people that let us use uh, their equipment. So thank you for your time. I'll take any questions. So one question I have is, are there any pharmacological tools that target agents to use that are up and down? Uh, yes, yeah, so there is this OGT small molecule inhibitor. Uh, which was developed a few years ago, which we've used in flies, and so it's been used in uh, mice before, um, but mostly in cells. So to my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I don't know that people have used in real animals, but I would love to do a study, like if we now give it perhaps the rats, what's happening, right? It's a similar mechanism uh, going on in, in the sensory, in the sensory cells, or at least maybe in the support cells of some cells. I can just sneak one more question in here. So can you just give us a sense of how common it is for these like conservation enzymes to actually physically exist mm. in the PRP2 or other Oh, yeah, so this is sort of a new field. There is a really nice review, I think, in cell metabolism that just came out this uh, January. I think if you search metabolic enzyme moonlighting, you'll find it. I'm happy to, uh, to send it to you if you send me an email. And so there are more and more cases like this. So perhaps this is not to say that every metabolic enzyme will uh, will sit on chromatin, but several metabolic enzyme are nucleocytoplasmic proteins that have a nuclear component. Uh, and some people think is to either have a catalytic activity, like very likely in this uh, in this uh, example, or sometimes create a pool of local metabolites. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, thinking about this acetylation, which is important for gene expression, that acetyl group also comes from metabolism. And so some people think that there might be nuclear pool that are higher on in acetyl-CoA, which can confuse a certain genomic location. Um, so uh, the number, the examples are increasing. In terms of OGT, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only second, this paper is in bio archive, but it's uh, the, the second uh, example uh, the second, the second uh, experiment where OGT has been found to be on chromatin uh, directly. The previous example was in this embryonic stem cell. It's on the chromatin or it's on the outside? Um, well, the experiments were done with chip. Uh, so, uh, and, and there are, there have been some reports that there are uh, gluconylated histones too, uh, histone too. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So in the beginning, we talked about the fire and the fire we found high sugar diet to nice plasticity. So why do you shift the fire from high sugar diet back to normal diet? Yes. Do you see the worst? Yeah, so, so we don't raise them on sugar. We just expose them as essentially young adults about four days. Uh, but uh, so if we put them on a high sugar diet for seven days and then we remove them and we test them three weeks later, they still have taste deficits uh, <laughs> that yeah. are dependent on the activity of, of uh, the chromatin complex. So if we inhibit it pharmacological or genetically, we can restore it. Yeah, so, um, and we also have done a study on the recovery with rats, but um, maybe you can go visit High End Poster ACAM to find out what we found. Have you looked at the, you know, the, the taste receptor? Do yes. You find any modification in the down regulation or regulation? Yeah, so we have looked at the mRNA levels. We don't see any changes. That was our first uh, hypothesis. And uh, for, um, I know that other people, when uh, uh, they put in, uh, mice on a high fat diet, there have been some components of the sweet taste receptor, one of the subunits, there have been some decrease. Uh, so that's something I would really, I would really love to study in more detail. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, synaptic protein channels. Yeah. Um, so in this case, while we uh, inhibit PRC2 levels or inhibit PRC2 activity, uh, even as we are driving OGT, we can block the effects of the OGT overexpression. So uh, at least I'm not excluding the possibility of OGT. Actually, more certainly, it's also doing other things. But at least in terms of this uh, reprogramming of this like case network of this transcriptional state network, it seems to be going to the PRC two. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So if you look in the chat, oh, the chat. One question. Okay, and then I'll take Amber's question. Um, in the slide, in the slide where you compare the lick numbers between controlled diet and sugar diet, it seems that for the high sugar diet flies, the flies initially lick much less. Um, however, between day four and five, the lick counts reverse with the two groups. So interesting. Could you please speculate that might happen during this period to trigger the tipping point? Um, yeah. So uh, flies are really good at compensating their uh, feeding behavior. Uh, the amount they're eating, uh, re de depending on the caloric density of the food. So uh, if you remember in that slide, the sugar diet at first are, are essentially not eating as much as the control diet. That's because they're licking the same, they're licking the food. And so they need a lot less volume to get to the same uh, calories. And conversely, if you gave flies very, very calorically diluted food, they actually be eating through the night to match the same level of calories. I don't think we ever published that, but we, we found that. Um, so in this case, there's something happening. So the flies on a sugar diet are eating more and more. So it's not that they're licking more than the controlled diet, but they're also licking more than the first few days. Uh, so um, we have looked at their ability to tell calories and nutrients. Actually, that was the main goal of my lab, and we didn't find any changes in that. And the way actually we came up across some of the taste changes were by doing the control experiments and some of those nutrient sensing, calorie sensing mechanisms we were testing. So at least in our hands, uh, the flies on a high sugar diet don't have a deficit. But uh, if we start to manipulate some of the um, calorie and nutrient reward pathways, um, we do find an effect and an interaction with the sweetness. So actually one of our prediction is that um, the chemosensory changes very likely are affecting the um, sensory calorie prediction and there's probably a mismatch there that's also driving it. Um, so that's something uh, that we want to investigate further. And Amber, you have a question, yeah. Yes. So at the very beginning of your talk, you uh, talked about uh, how putting the flies on sugar diet would be interesting to see, and you could see if they're making on glucose, fructose, yes. glucose, but not fructose. And so the question is, um, do you see differences between the caloric sugars, given that they're metabolized differently, yeah. and like for example, fructose in particular is thought to be more metabolically unhealthy. Yes. Um, so one of the interesting thing is like we don't really know how fructose is metabolized in uh, flies. So for instance, when I've done some experiments where I fed fructose to class of flies and measured the blood sugar, I could see an increase in glucose, which is not what you would predict in mammals. So I I don't I don't know what fruct I'm not I think that likely fructose is the bioavailability of it is probably different in invertebrates, and so. I'm not sure how to interpret uh, the data in this case, but in terms of the things we tested were mostly just with the sensory end. So we haven't really spent much time exploring that. Uh, one thing that we did find is that's interesting is the level of protein in food uh, seemed to have an effect. So if we added more protein in the same high sugar food, we still saw the phenotypes where there were delayed compared to a more like um, a food where we give them it's more carb-based and lower protein, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting given the the uh, vertebrate studies. Yeah, go ahead. Well, this is kind of following Amber's. If you fistulated these animals, they only got the century component. Would you see that in genetic effect? Uh, Most adjusted part critical for this. I think it is critical. Um, 
it's I don't think that yes I think it is a metabolic sensing I think the metabolic sensing at least from our genetic approach is uh, the, the part that can be manipulated and the sensory neuron is sufficient but that's not to say that there are other peripheral effects that could be happening for example one might imagine that as the flies eat more and more sugar and they develop this metabolic consequences, which you know, have, are, have similar hallmarks of what uh, humans and mammals experience, those sensory deficits might, be, uh, might become even worse or there might be additional things that are happening. But, uh, but yes, I do think that the metabolic component is, is yeah. Oh, okay. So, Scott, do you think that this mechanism of repression of transcription, do you think that this is also in other cell types? Ah, I love that question. So, we have started to measure other uh, cell specific transcriptional differences, and we don't see it. There are other ah, things that are that interesting. interesting. Yes. So, I thought I had a slide here, but I might have like removed it in you know, the days of my first in-person talk. Um, I think I did, um, it was a very nice slide. Okay, well, that's fine. So um, I think of it as uh, nutritional data versus nutritional information. I think all cells are getting the data, well, in different ways, like in the brain, some cells are get, get, getting different data, whether they're closer to say the ventricles or, or not, or who they're talking to. but there's an amount of data, sensory, nutritional data that all cells are getting. And I think the effects of that data depends on the cellular context. So one of the things we're looking at now is how the neuronal activity, so the context of the cell in a sensory neuron is gonna be very different because they're also basically activated by, by sweet uh, compounds. And so there's the nutritional information, but also the activity. And, uh, and we think that together, well, I, I am speculating that the activity together with the nutritional metabolic information is turning that into a data that that's processed in different ways. And one of the way uh, which is processed different inside the cellular context is that also every cell has its own neighborhood, right? Not all genes are accessible at all times. And there, there are different chromosome territories there are silencing foci, active foci, and so I think some of the effects are cell specific will be dependent on the context, and some of them of the geography of that particular cell type in the case. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said that this is like a long term and maybe permanent change. Is that possible to reverse it? Um. So in flies, uh, it is, uh, and one reason might be these are neurons, they're post-metodic cells and they're not renewing, right, which is quite different from, uh, from mammals, so I kind of gave away the answer there. But um, we did reverse it by uh, giving flies histone via satellite inhibitors, uh, so we can, you know, pry the chromatin open uh, and we can reverse it. We can also reverse it by uh, blocking, uh, inhibiting the activity of the chromatin repressor. So it seems to be uh, persistently required to be turned off, uh, to turn off the neurons. Um, so you have to kind of dislodge it from the chromatin in one way or the other. Um, there are other things that would be really interested in trying like intermittent fasting or maybe exercising the flies. There's endurance exercise models for Drosophila, but we haven't tried any of that. Yeah. So how long do you see that changing? So we have gone out to three weeks, which is a long time because flies survive about you know six to eight months, depending on how nice you are to them. Uh, <laughs> essentially, how healthy you keep them, and uh, so you know we put them on a high sugar diet. So they're about a, a little less than a week old, and then we put them on a high sugar diet for a week, and then we do reverse of the three weeks. So they're like seniors you know by the end so we went out pretty far to five weeks so far so i don't know how it would happen but also you know i think in flies are also age dependent chemosensory changes so we haven't gone beyond that but yeah 
So you're suggesting that you only like, move the sugar away from the inside? Nope, they regain, they regain the regular body fat because they're forced to eat whatever we're giving them. That's the part that's much easier to do in flies. Um, uh, but they're not regaining their sensory. Yeah. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you.